Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Jeff McMahon. He is a secure, a secure and White's Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm leaving links to our first two interviews in the description box of this one. Uh, and today we're going to talk basically about academic freedom. So, Jeff, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, as I said earlier, uh, you, you run an amazing set of interviews here. Oh, thank you so much and thank you for your support as well. So, um, we're, we're talking about academic freedom here, but I would like to start with, uh, I guess, a broad question or a broader question. So, what, do you, what would you say is the role of universities? Universities have many roles and functions, um, and different universities emphasize different roles or, or functions. There are some universities that uh, concentrate primarily on teaching, that is, on the uh, transmission of knowledge and the cultivation in students of the ability to think and reason carefully, impartially, independently, and critically. And uh, at these universities, knowledge of a particular field and effectiveness in teaching are the primary criteria for hiring faculty. There are other universities that generally go under the label um, research universities, where uh, new research, that is the discovery of new knowledge, is the primary function of the university, though teaching is done and is very important and is often done by the people who are the leading figures in, in, in the field. But those people tend to be hired primarily because they are going to make contributions to uh, knowledge in the, in, in the area. They're going to make advances in the area, and not, not so much because they are particularly good at um, teaching. But um, effective teaching, I think, is absolutely essential for having an enlightened citizenry and is therefore crucial for the flourishing of democracy. And I think the crises in democracy that we see in many countries today uh, are indicative of a, a serious failure of universities to fulfill the teaching function effectively um, or, or to fulfill it well enough in serving the, the whole population and not just some segment of the population. Um, there are other functions of universities. Um, they provide vocational training, usually at the higher levels, for example, they, uh, in, in medicine, law, engineering, and so on. And universities also um, seek to preserve, but also to reform, extend, and enhance um, the, the culture of, uh, of, of the society in which the university is based. So universities have departments of fine arts and music and so on. Uh, so it fulfills the, the, you know, all, the, all these functions. And let me ask you a related question that I think it's important to address and will be informative when it comes to some of the other questions we're uh, addressing today. Do you think that academia and academic work is incompatible with political activism? I'm asking you this because uh, there are many people, and we're going to get more into this from the right and the left, or the left of the political spe spectrum, that argue that uh, things like political activism or promoting I don't know, political ideas on campus is incompatible with uh, academia. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it would be inappropriate for a, a chemistry professor mm -hmm. to use class time to proselytize for his or her 
political views um, or uh, you know a physics professor or something of the sort but uh, people who teach for example moral philosophy or political philosophy or political science or political theory or in some instances sociology and and, and so on um, these are fields that address questions of, of morality and politics um, and uh, it's, I think, inescapable that uh, some people who are deeply concerned about moral and political issues will precisely for that reason go into academia because they want to devote their time and energy to thinking very hard about these issues and trying to discover what's true about these, these matters. And uh, it's going to be difficult for them to avoid some uh, expression of their own views uh, mm -hmm. in, in the classroom. Now, I do know people who teach moral and political philosophy who try scrupulously to avoid um, championing their own ideas in the classroom. Um, I myself have tended to follow a different uh, method. I often present arguments for the views that I think are true and invite challenges from the, the students and welcome challenges from the students. And in the past, I have often given the, the highest grades to the students who challenge me the most because I learn from them. If they, you know, if they're serious and they're capable and they're attacking my views, what, what could be better? I learned from that. I, I under, you know, I come to understand the weaknesses of my views and, and, and so on. Um, so I, th I think it, it, within the appropriate limits, it's perfectly acceptable for, for people to, uh, to, to, to be activists and to, to have strong political views and to um, have those discussed in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, people, it, have, people have to be forthright and honest about what they're doing. You mm -hmm. know, I, I tell in the past, I don't teach undergraduates at Oxford in the classroom context. I have given lectures to, to students and answered some questions. But um, when I used to teach regular undergraduate classes in the United States on um, issues in practical ethics, I would always tell my students exactly what I was doing. I would say, now I'm going to present some arguments for views that I think are the most plausible and um, tell me what's wrong with them, show, you know, and, and let's also discuss the opposing views and so on. But I, I don't try to hide what my beliefs are. But I explicitly tell the students, it's not going to make any difference to your grade whether you agree with me or disagree with me. And I, I, I was being sincere about that. Mm -hmm. So each of us has their own political, moral, religious views, views of other kinds. Do you think that if uh, any professor expresses their uh, views, their values in the public sphere, uh, if they go against what is considered, for example, normative in their own society, that they should be punished academically? Uh, definitely not. Um, I, 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 uh, if an academic person is expressing views about his or her own academic discipline in the public sphere, mm -hmm. I think that is protected by principles of academic freedom. But I also think that faculty uh, are free morally uh, uh, and professionally to express their views about sensitive or controversial matters of politics or religion or economics or morality or whatever in the public sphere without uh, uh, any fear of uh, there being any bad effects for their employment. And in particular, without fear of their being punished by the university. It, it, um, uh, when this happens, the university is uh, uh, outside its appropriate limits. I'll mention one case of this uh, a long time ago. 
uh, there was a man who taught somewhere on the East Coast. He was a Palestinian-American named Stephen Salaita. Um, he was uh, hired by the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is the main campus of the University of Illinois, to teach English literature there. Um, but he was a political activist, and uh, he this, this was at a time, one, one of the Israeli incursions into Gaza, and he wrote on social media various um, possibly intemperate uh, condemnations of the Israeli invasion of, mm -hmm. of Gaza. As it happens, I agreed with what he said. Um, uh, but uh, then, then members of the Board of Trustees and other people took this to it, 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 it be anti-Semitism or something of the sort, and the bo Board of Trustees of the university had a meeting and voted, and, and his contract was canceled. Now, this is a man who had already signed the contract. He had quit his job on the East Coast. He had sold his house there. He was getting ready to move out to Illinois. And his, suddenly his job was taken away from him. And the last I heard of Stephen Salaita, he was a, a, a bus driver. Um, and he had written a number of books. You know, he was a prominent uh, academic. Now, this was detestable. And in fact, there was a there was a kind of informal boycott of the University of Illinois, and I was actually scheduled to go there and give a lecture to the philosophy department. Um, it had been advertised and so on, and I withdrew uh, from that and said I was going to respect the boycott and not go speak at that university because of what it, the, the, the chancellor had uh, approved of doing to. Salaita. And I wrote a letter to the chancellor of the university saying that's exactly why I refused to come. And I will say to, to their credit, most I had I used to I, I had formerly taught at the University of Illinois. Um, and so the mem many of the members of the philosophy department there were, were uh, former colleagues of mine. And most of them supported me in my refusal to speak there. They, they, they too thought that what had been done to Salaita was unjust. That's the kind of thing that should never happen. Mm -hmm. So um, this is perhaps one of the most controversial questions I have to ask you today, but do you think that um, people nowadays are talking a lot about threats to academic uh, freedom? Do you think, uh, first of all, uh, do you agree that academic freedom is under threat? And second of all, if so, uh, do you think do you agree with certain people when they say that perhaps it comes more from one side of the political aisle than the other, or not? I do think academic freedom is under threat, um, mm. more so than it has been in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, the, there are kind of more visible instances of attempts to prevent speakers from coming to universities and that sort of thing from people on the left. But there is a long history of uh, threats to academic freedom from people on the right as well. Um, I think the, the, uh, the reaction to Stephen Salaita was primarily from the right, from the kind of pro-Israeli right. Um, there has, it, it, for a long time, many years, there has been an organization in the United States. I don't know what the name of the organization is, but they have a a website and so on. It's called Professor Watch List. And this is a right wing organization that encourages students to report online uh, uh, any instances of professors uh, defending left wing views in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the parents of students go that's, on. That's right. Yeah. Um, there have also been repeated attacks on climate science and personally on climate scientists from people on, on the right. Um, so it, it is not all from people on the left by any means. 
let me give you a couple of examples of um, a colleague uh, from the careers of colleagues of mine. Um, mm -hmm. I believe we're going to talk at some point about the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Yes. I have I have two co-editors uh, uh, for that journal. Um, one is Peter Singer. The other is Francesca Minerva. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter has faced repeated abuse from people on the political right, um, primarily because his views are so inconsistent with sort of fundamentalist Christianity in the United States. He has challenged the doctrine of the sanctity of human life and so on. So he has uh, faced a, a huge amount of uh, um, crit not, not just criticism, but, but abuse for that uh, from, from the right. He's also faced a lot of criticism from people on the left because of his views about um, uh, disability and um, you, uh, infanticide as euthanasia. Mm -hmm. My other co-editor uh, on, on the Journal of Controversial Ideas is Francesca Minerva, who I believe it was in 2012 with her then spouse, published an article in the Journal of Medical Ethics in which they defended a limited moral permissibility of infanticide. And somehow this article was spotted by people on the, on the far right in the United States who comb through the journals looking for uh, academic material to, to condemn and ridicule and, uh, on the internet and so on. Um, and as a result of that, um, she and uh, her then partner, Alberto Giubilini, received numerous death threats. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they were in Melbourne at the time. The university there advised them, stay home, don't come to your office. It, it's too dangerous, that kind of thing. Now that, the people on the left don't tend to produce death threats. So uh, I, I, I think, um, it's unfair to suggest that, um, uh, that all of this is all, all of the efforts at suppression of academic freedom and free speech are coming from the left. They, they, they're certainly not. There are more instances of this from the left now, and they're more visible, but they're also less serious in some ways. Um, and another point I would make is that, uh, and this is very important, particularly in the United States, the threats to academic freedom are coming. Uh, in law from the right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. This is where uh, governmental suppression of academic freedom is now occurring in very alarming ways. You look, for example, at what uh, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, has been pushing through um, for uh, higher education in Florida. It's just mm -hmm. appalling what's happening there. Mm -hmm. so, um, no, and so no, this is not a, a, a problem uh, that arises, that, that, of which the source is just the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add to that, by the way, that I've uh, had uh, Peter Singer and Francesca Minerva on the show. With Peter Singer, I didn't really address uh, the, those criticisms and abuse he received, but with Francesca Minerva, we talked about what back then she called post-birth abortion and, yeah. Uh, and and yeah we got a little bit into that and also uh, when it comes to what you just mentioned in Florida and, and with Ron DeSantis I mean it's not just the actual threat to academic freedom but also uh, along with that threat to academic freedom uh, LGBTQ people are being directly targeted so it's also a moral and the political issue in that particular case, I think. Certainly. So uh, when it comes to academic freedom, uh, I mean, what falls under its rubric exactly? So do you think we need to uh, determine if something uh, done by an academic is academic work for it to uh, be uh, defended uh, in, in terms of uh, someone having academic freedom or academic freedom to produce a specific kind of work in academia, or is that not really necessary? 
Let me begin by saying that, uh, as, as I said to you privately before we even began the interview, I don't have any particular academic expertise mm -hmm. in issues of free speech and academic freedom. There's a huge philosophical literature. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't had time to, to, to read it. It's not what I work on. So um, I, I, uh, uh, a lot of my answers to your questions are going to have to be rather tentative and, mm -hmm. and, and modest in their pretensions. Uh, so, um, but the, the question you ask, I think, is, is, is fairly straightforward uh, to answer. And that is that the concept of academic freedom is in no way precise. Um, we need to know what comes within the scope of the principle of academic freedom. We need to know what is protected and why. And this isn't just a matter of conceptual analysis. You're certainly not going to get the answer by looking at a dictionary or anything like that. It is a matter of substantive moral and political philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the answer to it, but this is something that's absolutely vital for um, people who are concerned with academic freedom and free speech to get clear about. And it's one of the things that one has to defend a particular view of. Mm -hmm. So um, the question I'm about to ask you, of course, uh, perhaps to address it properly, we would have to get into a discussion about uh, what's really the difference between academic freedom and freedom of expression or free speech. But uh, anyway, do you think that all speech and ideas should be allowed uh, on campus and in academic work? Or do you think that perhaps some, sometimes some, some form of censorship is or should be allowed? Um, I think there are very clear instances in which um, there are ideas that ought not to be expressed in an academic context, certainly not to, to students. I mean, the most obvious instances are things like this. Um, a, an academic should not be allowed to publish a paper that um, explains step by step how to create a, 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 a pandemic microbe. Mm -hmm. um, and no academic should be allowed to publish a paper that explains step by step how to build a nuclear bomb. Um, similarly, no academic should be able to um, argue for ethnic cleansing or, or something like that, you know, the, the, the extermination of another race. Where the boundary lies, I don't know, but certainly some ideas are extremely dangerous and potentially extremely harmful. And of course, those have to be censored or suppressed. Um, but there's a, a difficult question of determining where the boundary lies between acceptable and unacceptable. And again, I just have to um, be very modest here and say I have no idea where it lies. Um, and this is, again, something that is should be subject to vigorous and open and civil debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you think about uh, things like uh, trigger warnings? I mean, even with academic freedom in mind, uh, do you think that professors should take their the sensibilities uh, of their students into account or not? Um, yes, I do. I, I think um... Trigger warnings by themselves don't violate academic freedom or freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good when uh, professors use them uh, when, when necessary or appropriate. Um, I don't think, however, that they should be compulsory. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there are usually, you know, a student can talk to students who've taken a course before. Usually courses are repeated over and over again to find out whether there's going to be material that might make the student uncomfortable or that the student would find distressing and so on. Usually a, a syllabus is provided in advance of, of a course. You can usually find the syllabus online somewhere um, and find out what's going to be discussed. I think it also makes a difference whether the class is uh, one that is required or one that is optional for students to take. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, I don't think that I think that the students have considerable uh, um, resources at their disposal to find out for themselves whether um, something that might upset them is going to be discussed. And if they uh, if they can't, uh, uh, if it would be difficult for them to be a, in a room in which a, a particular issue is, is openly discussed, then it's usually possible for them to find out in advance that that's mm -hmm. likely to happen and avoid it themselves. So it, it, I don't think it should be compulsory for professors. But when it comes to students avoiding certain kinds of topics, do you think that if they choose to do so, if, for example, in class they would be exposed to something that because of some personal experiences they have, for example, really uh, hurts them, I mean, being exposed to certain kinds of topics and ideas, uh, if the students choose to not attend uh, specific classes, you think they should be penalized for that or not? Uh, in general, uh, no, I don't think they should be penalized. Um, again, it's, a, it, it's complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one consideration is whether the course is one that they are required to take mm -hmm. for the degree or whether it's optional. Right. Another, another point is that for almost any class, whether required or optional, students are permitted to miss a certain number of the classes without having to provide any kind of explanation whatsoever. I think that there should be some attendance requirements uh, for most classes. That is to say, I don't, uh, it, it would seem to be odd that a student would be able to get a, a, a passing mark for a class without ever going to it. Um, that's you know, part of what being taught is, is going to the class, listening to what the professor says, in many cases exchanging views with the professor, engaging in discussion and so on. That's what the educational process mm -hmm. consists in. And so uh, in, in many instances professors don't have any attendance requirements. In other cases there are attendance requirements. When there are attendance requirements, um, I think students who can expect that they may be upset by a topic that would be discussed on a certain day, they can just uh, uh, reserve their allowance of uh, uh, absences for those days and just not go, and that's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, there are, again, there's a more complicated problem, and that is if the student has no idea that a certain topic is going to be discussed, and the topic then comes up, for example, raised by another student in, in, mm -hmm. in discussion, and the, the student who has had some bad experience in the past finds this very traumatic to have this discussed, I think the, 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 the student can, should just stand up, say to the professor, please excuse me, walk out, and then later explain to the professor, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, um, I, I just couldn't. And, and any professor should obviously excuse that. Mm -hmm. um, another question I would like to ask you is, uh, to what extent, or uh, do, do you think that professors should take into account at all uh, the cultural context they operate in, that is, if they work in a particular university, in a particular country, that is where a particular culture operates with particular kinds of norms of speech and discourse, do you think that 
that should also be taken into account in the kinds of work they do and how they express themselves or not at all? Um, my main answer would be not at all. Mm -hmm. I think there might be instrumental reasons or prudential reasons for um, being in some ways respectful of the prevailing norms. On the other hand, um, these norms are never sacrosanct. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are very bad norms. Often there are very bad norms in societies and cultures. And those norms need to be challenged. And I think it's probably the professor's not only right, but duty to challenge those norms. If the norms aren't challenged, they will just stagnate and the culture will stagnate. Be worse for everybody. If the norms are bad, they need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And if they're good and somebody mistakenly challenges them, then you have a controversy, but that's life. So I want to get into the Journal of Controversial Ideas in a second, but just before that, uh, since you are a moral philosopher, I'm really curious about this. So what do you think is the role of moral philosophers as academics specifically? With respect to this question of academic freedom or quite generally? Uh, both. Well, with respect to academic freedom um, and free speech, there are, of course, there's a legal side to these issues, and that's the province of legal theorists. But academic freedom and free speech are primarily moral and political problems, and they are problems that moral and political philosophers are professionally best equipped to, to, to think about. So it's mm -hmm. our duty as moral philosophers, some of us anyway, to, to think as impartially and carefully and rigorously and meticulously about these issues as we can. And there are people who do this. I'm not one of them, but uh, there, there are such people. Um, in general, moral philosophy is such a wide ranging field that there's no one role that moral philosophers have. Um, there are people who specialize in the history of moral philosophy, and they help to illuminate the writings of the great moral philosophers from the past. Mm -hmm. There are people who specialize in metaethics, which is the subject of what the nature of morality is. and whether moral propositions are true or false, and whether uh, morality is something that we find in reality or something that we project onto morality or, or, or is just in our sentiments or, and, and preferences and so on. And then there are people who do what's called normative ethics, which is uh, the study of uh, moral theories and moral principles. What's the What's the correct set of, um, of, of moral principles? What's the correct moral theory? There are people who defend Kantian moral philosophy and utilitarianism, more generally mm -hmm. consequentialism or contractualism. There are all these theories about which principles should actually guide our action or should our action not be guided by principles but by some understanding of the virtues. So there's a, a huge range of possibilities here. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there are also uh, people whose work in moral philosophy is primarily on specific moral problems. They work in what's called practical ethics or applied ethics. Um, that's a, in, in the past couple of hundred years, that's a relatively new development. For most of the 20th century, for example, there was really no such thing as practical ethics. Um, but starting around the late 1960s and so on, this field developed and began to, to, to flourish. And these are the people who do address moral problems like academic freedom, but a huge range of other problems uh, in, in that, that are problems of practical morality, how we ought to live and what we ought to do. And of course, practical ethics is tightly connected with normative ethics. Mm -hmm. But basically, moral philosophers are people who devote their lives 
to thinking as carefully and as deeply and as rigorously as possible about some aspect of what we call morality, what it is, what the correct set of principles are, what we should think about particular problems and so on. Mm -hmm. So about the Journal of Controversial Ideas then, so could you tell us uh, what the journal is really about, what motivated you, uh, Peter Singer and Francesca Minerva to create it? Uh, I mean, why basically did you feel the need to create such a journal and where, what are its goals, basically? Well, the way the journal started was that uh, Francesca, it was Francesca's idea. Okay. And she approached Peter and me to ask if we would be willing to join her in trying to establish some journal of this sort. Mm -hmm. And we agreed to, to help her out. She was motivated um, in large measure by her own experiences of being threatened for her, the, the views that she had expressed as a philosopher in mm -hmm. a proper philosophy journal. Uh, you know, it's not as if she had gone out in the public and been proselytizing. This was in a esoteric or arcane academic journal for people who work in medical ethics. Mm -hmm. But it fell into the hands, as, as you know, of these uh, people on the right in the United States and uh, uh, created quite a furor in that community. Right. Um, and she because of that experience, I think, was unusually sensitive to what was being done to other academics some five or six years ago. I think uh, the case of Rebecca Tuvel was uh, an important motivator. This was a, uh, an untenured uh, philosophy professor at a university, I believe, in western Tennessee. I'm not sure. Um, who published an article uh, in a journal, I think, called Hypatia, in which she argued that the arguments that people give for the claim that um, trans women are women and trans men are men, that we can, we can choose our identities in some way, mm -hmm. those arguments applied equally to race. And so she was defending uh, this woman whose name I forget, who had been uh, who, who was, I don't know how to put this, born white, but decided that her, her sense of self was as a, a, a black person. So she sort of adopted the identity of a black person and passed for a black person. Um, and it came out that she wasn't. And, and Rebecca Tuvel, I think, you know, argued that uh, the same arguments that support recognition of transgender people should also support recognition of transracial people. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was attacked by a huge number of senior academics who published some kind of open letter or whatever calling for the retraction of the paper and condemnation of her views and so on and so forth. So it was instances of phenomena like that where, in which the, the, the personal lives and careers of academics were being imperiled because of broad responses to their, hostile responses to their work facilitated by social media and the internet. And uh, again, the Salita case was another one that was uh, prior to the Tuvel case. And again, that one, came, uh, the criticism of Salita came from the right, the criticism of Tuvel came from the left. Um, and Francesca's idea was that there should be a journal that would enable philosophers and others to publish ideas that might attract hostility and disrupt their lives in very painful and harmful ways. These, the, the, the people who, who had these ideas and wanted to ha get them into circulation could publish their work under a, a, a pseudonym. So mm -hmm. they could not be identified as the author. Um, and Peter and I thought that was a good idea. That is, um, 
people should be able to argue for, give evidence for, give the reasons for views that they think are correct that other people find abhorrent or offensive or immoral or, or, or whatever without having to sacrifice their lives and careers to get the ideas mm-hmm. in circulation. So that's, that's really why we uh, founded the journal. Mm-hmm. Uh, by, by the way, just before I move on to the next question about the journal, uh, let me just refer the audience to an interview that I'm releasing in a few months, I think probably in October with Rebecca Tuvel. I've interviewed her recently and we didn't really get into the controversy itself, but we talked about her arguments surrounding transgenderism and transracialism, which are indeed interesting. So. Um, just if people are interested, then look for that interview. So, um, and what is basically a controversial idea then? Well, it's a it's not a univocal concept. Um, there are controversies within disciplines or within fields. Mm-hmm. There are controversies in physics. There are controversies in which in all academic areas in which ideas in the, in the field are hotly contested by uh, uh, those who believe that the ideas are true and those who believe that the ideas are false. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not the sense of controversial idea that um, we have in mind in the title of the journal. What we mean by a controversial idea is uh, an idea that some people find to be true and important, other people find to be abhorrent, dangerous, immoral, offensive. And so the expression of these ideas leads to hostility and polarization and um, denunciations and vitriolic exchanges without actually debating the merits of the ideas. And so what we wanted to do in the Journal of Controversial Ideas was to provide a forum in which these ideas that normally just produce a lot of vitriol Mm -hmm. are discussed by people on both sides of the issue in ways that are civil and that give the reasons, the arguments, and the evidence on both sides without ad hominem comments and without polemics. And um, if I can call attention to what I think is one of our successes in this uh, 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 ambition, um, there was a paper by Alex Byrne about uh, transgender issues. What What is it to be a woman? What What is being a woman consist in, and same thing might be said of a man as well. And uh, this paper came to us because Byrne had published a paper, um, a reply to it was published uh, by a transgender person in Philosophical Studies. Byrne wrote a reply to that criticism of his view. Um, The editor, I think, of the journal, I I may be getting my facts wrong here, I can't remember all the details, but my belief is the editor was in favor of publishing it, um, publishing Byrne's reply. Um, I think it had good external reviews and so on, but members of the editorial board protested, didn't want to publish the paper, and the editor resigned, but the paper was rejected. Byrne sent it to us. Uh, We had it, we, we sent it out for peer review and uh, we decided to publish it. Um, but I was contacted by someone um, I know who's, who, who's, uh, who, whose views are, are, are highly pro-transgender. Um, and that person wrote a, a, a reply to Burns' paper under a pseudonym. Mm-hmm. Um, and both writers, uh, Byrne and the pseudonymous critic confine themselves to the reasons and the arguments. They, they, they provided 
you know, charitable interpretations of each other's views and so on. It was, it was a serious philosophical debate without, I mean, well, I think, you know, put it in the terms of the old cliches, there was a lot of light, but no heat. And right. that's the way these, these debates should be conducted. And so I'm, I'm particularly, uh, proud of that exchange in the journal. We were, a, we were able to uh, make it possible for there to be this uh, very serious but, but polite civil uh, exchange of carefully reasoned arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what, the, what are the criteria for publication you have there? And I want to ask you that also because after this question I want to ask you Another one, we've already alluded to it, uh, at least to some extent, when I asked you uh, if you think that any sort of idea should be allowed to be expressed by an academic on campus or in academic work. And in a second, we might also get into what is the difference between academic freedom and academic competence or incompetence. So. What are the criteria that you apply in your journal? Well, the first one is that a paper should actually be controversial in the sense that I described earlier. Mm -hmm. It's not just an ordinary academic journal, but you know, which any kind of paper, however kind of bland and, and uh, boring it, it might be, can be can be published. Um, so that's the first condition. Um, Beyond that, um, it has to satisfy the standards of ordinary academic peer review. Most journals send out papers to only one or two external reviewers. We often send a paper to anywhere from three to five external reviewers. We when a paper is controversial, it's it's particularly important that it should be uh, uh, should should satisfy, and we should be quite certain that it satisfies the normal standards for academic publication. Mm -hmm. It's got to be good work in the relevant area, right. and that's hard for us because the three of us are philosophers. So we have a we have an editorial board who help us out in these matters, um, but um, it is difficult being a co-editor of a kind of multidisciplinary journal when we have no competence in, in some of the areas in which the uh, authors uh, work. Uh, so it's, 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 it's basically that, um, which the ideas need to be controversial for our journal to be the right journal to publish them in. Um, but otherwise, they need to meet the, the, the to satisfy the standards of the of whatever discipline they may be in. And when it comes to satisfying these the standards of particular academic disciplines, um, I want to ask you a little bit more about that because I mean perhaps it's possible that some academics also share this view, but particularly with uh, the ongoing very inflammatory so-called culture war on the internet and all of that. There are people uh, that sometimes express a, a view along the lines of, okay, so if certain um, ideas are not published in uh, academic uh, journals or if certain ideas are uh, not really mentioned, referred to, talk about in academia. Uh, it's because they are being uh, suppressed. It's because they are ideas from the political right or the political left. And it's because the academia is mostly this or that. But I, I, I mean, we should still apply standards, right? If for example, you are an immunologist and you are uh, teaching immunology classes and so on. And if you uh, just don't address at all the anti-vax position, for example, uh, I mean, is, is that really a matter of uh, really suppressing 
uh, academic freedom or not exposing the students to certain kinds of ideas because when certain things are just in this case from a scientific perspective but we could also talk about a philosophical perspective but are just plain wrong is there any problem at all with just not allowing them in uh, in publication in uh, papers in journals or even express them in an academic context? Well, let me say one thing initially, and that is if there are ideas in a particular academic field or discipline that are just plain wrong, but are also highly influential okay. and also dangerous, mm -hmm. um, then I think it is the duty of people in the field to uh, explain why these views are mistaken okay. as, as carefully and as clearly as they possibly can. Um, I do think uh, academics have responsibilities as academics, as thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, we're not here just to uh, uh, get to tenure and promotion and uh, 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 get recognition as uh, uh, intellectuals. Right. We, 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 if, if we're studying things that are of moral and social importance, um, then we have duties about uh, how we uh, mm -hmm present our ideas or whether we present our ideas and, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, Norm Chomsky wrote about this a long time ago, a very long time ago, in a piece on the responsibilities of intellectuals. And uh, I remember that was a, that was a very uh, influential uh, piece in my own career mm -hmm. um, as a philosopher. Um, but here's the important point. Um, Academic ideas, and theories, and so on need to be assessed by the standards within the discipline or the field mm -hmm. and not by uh, ideological criteria or on the basis of the identity, whatever that means, of the person who is mm -hmm. producing um, the idea or the theory. I mean, I don't, I don't think an idea or a theory in academia should have enhanced credibility because the author of this idea is, is of a certain gender or race or other ideolo or some ideological view. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be a, a, a name for that in philosophy. It's called the genetic fallacy. Um, yeah. you know, the, the, it, the plausibility of an idea doesn't depend on who produces it. Um, and I think that that uh, the tendency to think that, that, that um, only certain people are really entitled to, 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 to uh, speak and write about certain issues is a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but I mean, j just to make... People should be able, you know, what I mean by that is I don't mean that as you put it a moment ago, incompetent people should be um, provided with the means of, uh, uh, of circulating ideas that are, you know, fail the standards of, of the discipline. Mm -hmm. That that's, that's, would be absurd. Mm -hmm. but, um, ideas that may be morally or politically offensive to some people that do satisfy the standards of the discipline, yeah. those should be protected. And that's in part what the journal is, is intended to facilitate. Mm -hmm. So, just to make it clear, if uh, certain ideas that particular, for example, political groups might have do not circulate that much within academia because uh, they do not fulfill uh, the standards of particular disciplines, that's not necessarily a suppression of academic freedom, right? No. I mean... All of these bizarre delusional views that 
Trump supporters and other people on the far right in the United States have um, about the nature of the world and so on, those are not going to find expression in academia because there's no evidence for them. People believe these things because they want to believe them. People believe these things because they read about it in somebody else's social media posts or whatever. These people um, reinforce each other's delusions in this way. And so there may be a huge number of these people who believe these delusional things, um, like the QAnon stuff and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but they never give the evidence or the arguments for it. You know, there's, there's not there's not going to be any kind of academic publication defending the views that these people have because it's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it's not because it's being suppressed. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, related to that, in at least to some extent, what do you think about the concept of cancel culture? we've been hearing about so much in recent years. Do you think that uh, it makes sense to call at attacks against academic freedom a form of uh, cancel culture? Or I mean, as a philosopher, just generally speaking, what do you think of the concept? Like so many other notions in the popular culture, it's extremely vague and in general quite unhelpful. It's a journalistic term. Um, if you ask people what it means, people will have very different um, answers to, to, to the question. Uh, so I think it's a pretty unhelpful concept. Uh, as it happens, I think it's a, a, a term that is used more by people on the right to condemn uh, the activities of students and professors who are trying to prevent certain people from speaking on campus or from teaching at a university or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's a term that uh, is often used, but I think is, is very vague. So again, um, you don't hear left-wing people using that term to describe professor watch list or what's being done in, in Florida by DeSantis. Mm -hmm. I mean, DeSantis is crusading on the basis of being an opponent to cancel culture, yes. and yet there he is preventing the teaching of various things in universities. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the hypocrisy of these people on the right is just astounding, particularly mm -hmm. in the United States. Right. Uh, by the way, since we were just talking about uh, controversial uh, questions and ideas a second ago, um, do you think that questioning uh, academic freedom or freedom of sp or free speech could also be itself a controversial question? I mean, if someone uh, would present good arguments against uh, some form of freedom of expression, uh, would you be willing to publish it in your journal, for example? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm not myself aware of uh, good arguments of that mm -hmm. sort, but it's entirely possible. And yes, uh, if, if people think that there should be limits, you know, uh, perhaps fairly drastic limits to freedom of expression and academic freedom. And if they've got, if, if they've got arguments and reasons for this, um, uh, and they're not just transparently absurd, then yes, that, 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 that too comes within the scope of freedom of expression. And um, it's probably very healthy for everyone to consider the arguments and see what merit there might be in them. There, there might be an element of truth in, in it uh, that, that we're un, unaware of. We don't know everything. Um, I mean, I, there is, a, there is a, a tendency of some people to say that when, um, for example, students and others are shouting down speakers and trying to prevent people from being able to speak, uh, at, at universities and so on, they are themselves engaged in free expression. Um, and I, th I think that's true, but it's free expression of 
uh, views that are opposed to free expression. Right. I mean, a, a, a salient instance of that was the appearance of Kathleen Stock here at the University of Oxford a few weeks ago. Um, if, if you'd like to talk about that incident at, uh, at some point, I'm happy to do so. I actually went along to that and so observed firsthand um, some of what people refer to as cancel culture, the, the activities of people who were uh, representatives of what is thought of as cancel culture. So if you want, if you want to come back to that, I'd be happy to mention that. Oh, oh yes, uh, let's get into it right away. I mean, I have just one more question, but then perhaps as a, an illustrative example, tell us more about that. Okay. Um, Stock was invited to come uh, speak at the Oxford Union, which is a kind of independent organization. It's not an element of the university. Um, the um, uh, 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 certain groups here, the gay lesbian group, and uh, the, even the, the, the student union itself, uh, protested about the invitation to Kathleen Stock, who is n known for her uh, questioning of some of the uh, uh, fundamental beliefs of the transgender movement. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, it, it, the event went ahead and uh, what happened was that after people were inside the building, protesters arrived and were shouting outside the, most of the time that the um, event was going on. Very early on in the event, there were several people who had been admitted into the room, turned out to be among the protesters, and a couple of them jumped up and handed out leaflets and that sort of thing and then left the room. One of them uh, went right up to the front and glued his or her hand to the floor with super glue uh, and sat there rigid. Um, uh, and it took about a half an hour for the police to come and detach this person from the floor without harming the person mm -hmm. in detaching the hand. And so what happened was everybody, I don't know, maybe there were 200 people in the room. All these 200 people had to sit there and waste a half hour of their time wait, waiting for this person to be um, taken out. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the protesters thought of this as, uh, as a great triumph. Um, what was actually going on in the room was that the very beginning of the event, the president of the student union began asking Kathleen Stock very um, challenging questions. Mm -hmm. He was challenging her as, as, as well as he could. And, and doing quite well at it. And as it turned out, the whole event, I thought, I, I thought when I decided to go to it that she was going to give a talk, but that wasn't what happened. The whole event was that the president of the student union followed by other uh, members of the union and then followed by members of the audience quite generally put questions to Kathleen Stock, which were in general highly challenging, mm -hmm. uh, forcing her to defend her views. Um, what was going on outside, what was, you know, so, so the person who glued the hand to the floor um, wasn't interested in, in exchanging ideas and arguments. Mm -hmm. um, and the people outside weren't either. Um, when I left, a huge mob of people outside chanting and yelling with banners and posters and that sort of thing. Um, as I happened to be going through the crowd, the, they were being led by one student whose um, who's brilliant uh, 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 chant was, um, fuck the union. So they were all just going, fuck the union, fuck the union. And then there was somebody, there were three or four people with a huge banner that said, uh, trans women are real women. And I thought, if these people are so confident that that is true, that trans women are real women, why didn't they come inside 
and give the arguments and the reasons for that um, and challenge Kathleen Stock and engage in debate mm -hmm. rather than just trying to disrupt the, 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 the event and assert these things without any reasons or arguments. The, you know, that might be uh, appropriate if the things were completely obvious to everyone. You know, if I if I if I had a banner that said, um, you know, grass is green or something like that, um, uh, you wouldn't expect me to have to defend that view. It's just too mm -hmm. obvious. But um, you know, what the banners say is not obvious to everybody, and therefore, if you want to get that idea across, you have to come defend it with 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 reasons and arguments, and not just shout and have a banner and try to prevent other people from challenging what you believe. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I thought the protests at this event were, were disgraceful. Um, you know, the people had the opportunity to come and challenge Kathleen Stock as people in the room did, but they chose not to do that. They, they chose not to pursue reasoning and argument and evidence and civil discourse, mm -hmm. which is the only way you're going to per persuade somebody that they're wrong. These people think Kathleen Stock is obviously really deeply, badly, dangerously wrong. They're not going to persuade her or anybody who is, who is persuaded by her arguments, and she does give arguments. They're not going to persuade any of those people to change their minds by saying, you're immoral, you're wicked, you should be silenced, and so on. That's totally counterproductive. It's totally self-defeating. I don't understand why they can't see this. Yeah, uh, also, I guess that because in that particular case and others, it's not just a matter of uh, epistemic slash intellectual, intellectual interest, but also, I guess, in this case, if you're trying to, for example, defend the rights of minorities like trans people, I mean, since we live in the culture we live in, I mean, yeah, it's perhaps sometimes it's bothersome but you have to try to convince other people that you're right correct but what i'm saying is you won't do it by wasting people's time by gluing yourself to the floor yeah. and preventing a debate from going on and by threatening the speaker and by making so much noise that people have trouble hearing what the speaker is saying and, and so on Mm -hmm. These, I, 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 I am, you know, fully in sympathy with the the, the uh, transgender people and their um, mm -hmm. efforts to um, achieve appropriate recognition in society and so on. But the way they were behaving at the stock lecture is not the way to do it. It's self-defeating, in my view, mm -hmm. and it's wrong. Yeah. It's been very, very harmful to people like Kathleen Stock. You know, they go on about tangible harm to this, that, and the other. I mean, she simply couldn't go on teaching at, at, at the university. It was too, too, too demoralizing and threatening. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it was similar for uh, uh, Rebecca Tuvel. I'm told. I don't know her. I've never spoken with her, but um, I do know people who know her well, and they've mm -hmm. told it was just hugely traumatic to her as a junior academic to be condemned by so many senior people in her own field and in other people and in other fields. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as I said earlier, I didn't uh, I'm not very familiar with the details of the Rebecca Tuvel controversy. I'm just familiar with her arguments, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've had also, as I said, Francesca Minerva on the show and we addressed uh, also a bit the controversy and yeah, it can be very, very traumatic for an academic or any other people who expresses their intellectual views publicly. So, Yeah, there's harm on both sides. Yeah. So uh, one final question then, and uh, we've already, I guess, addressed this to some extent, but I would get, I would like to hear more about your views on it. So. Do you think that the motivations of academics matter? I mean, as long as they do rigorous work, does it matter if they are particularly motivated by their own politics? And uh, let me just take a second to illustrate that with a specific example. So 
for example, uh, I've had on the show uh, people who point to an issue in uh, medicine, for example, where um, uh, apparently women, some women's health issues have not been properly studied because since uh, apparently women are, have more hormone fluctuations, it's harder to study women than men. And so in the development of particular uh, drugs or uh, in trying to study certain health conditions, it's been mostly men that have been studied and not so much women. And so, uh, I mean, some people who argue for that might be politically motivated, they might be feminists, for example, but they're actually making a, a good arguments, good science. And I mean, for me personally, it doesn't matter at all if they're feminists or not, because the issue they're pointing to is a very real issue that should be addressed. And it's done through uh, good science, through good methodology. And I, I'm not asking you to, to comment on this specific example. I, I was just illustrating my question here. But what do you think about uh, the motivations of academics, generally speaking? Um. Sorry. What I think is, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to, to, to express this quite right, but um, my, my, my view is that if their motivation is good, that's good. And if their motivation is bad, that's bad. Um, you know, suppose um, uh, someone wants to publish a paper about the characteristics of some group, um, you know, maybe some ethnic group or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they want to do this because they want this to be ammunition for um, anti-immigrationists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that, that, that that's bad motivation. On the other hand, if the work satisfies all the relevant standards and so on, then it probably ought to be published. The question is, does it satisfy the standards? Um, in my work in moral philosophy, and I know in Peter Singer's work in moral philosophy and many other moral philosophers, um, the work is morally motivated, morally and politically motivated. Very mm -hmm. early in my career, I, I wrote a lot about nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, this was a long time ago, and people don't really um, refer back to that literature anymore. But in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a there was a literature in philosophy about the ethics of nuclear deterrence, and and um, I was wholly sort of morally and politically motivated in in what I in, in trying to understand those issues because I, I thought they were just hugely important. And so being morally or politically motivated, I think, is fine. But people can be badly morally and politically motivated. You know, there were moral and political philosophers who, who, who wrote in support of Nazi ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were just badly motivated. Mm -hmm. And much of the work is not very good, whatever you know, it covers. But... Uh, so, and in some ways, that's just sort of obvious, I think. <laughs> uh, but, but I guess the point is, one doesn't have to be kind of impersonally and impartially motivated simply by the desire to achieve the truth for its own sake. Mm -hmm. in, in a particular area, one can be motivated by uh, the desire to produce a better world. And I think often scientists are motivated that way, moral philosophers are often motivated that way, and so on. And that's good, mm -hmm. if it, particularly if it leads people to do good work. Mm -hmm. If they are willing to be wrong, that's, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, when I taught my classes, and when I show people my work, and when I give lectures, what I want 
is criticism. Um, I want objections to my work. I don't. I don't. I want to. I want to be aware of the objections. I don't want to make mistakes. It's important that we get these things right, and I don't want to publish stuff that's just mistaken. What a stupid thing to do. I mean, if, if my my work, I want it to have practical effects. But if it's going to have practical effects, it better be right, not mm -hmm. mistaken. And so, I mean, there was one instance in which I I had um, I had published an argument in two, two uh, academic papers. I'd used it in different ways. Um, and lots of uh, very distinguished philosophers had read this, th these papers before they were published. And, uh, and nobody caught the mistake I was making. And I had a, a graduate student whose field was epistemology um, who wrote a, a paper uh, and criticized my argument in these two papers. And I realized, He's completely right. I'd made this terrible mistake. I'd published it in two papers. And only when I realized that I had made this mistake was I able to see other things that had been hidden from me. And I, I was able to make a lot of progress, I think, in, in the direction of the truth as a result of this man's pointing out to me this mistake that I had made that many other really distinguished philosophers had failed to see. Um, so, you know, we always can learn. Um, and... Uh, you know, who wants to who wants to defend mistaken ideas? I don't. If I'm making a mistake, I want to know it. Yeah, right. No, I, I mean, I guess that uh, the point I was just trying to make and what I ask you about is if we should really be so worried about particular people being left wing or right wing. I mean, at least as far as I'm concerned, if their work is good if they're doing proper science and proper philosophy. I mean, who cares if they are left-wing, right-wing, if they are centrists, if they are feminists or whatever. I, I, I mean, yeah, per, perhaps they say certain things that are or make, make certain bad arguments. And yeah, we can address those arguments. But as far as, they, as their work is concerned, if it is good, rigorous, fine, as far as I'm concerned, at least. Right. I agree completely. And again, this is what the Journal of Controversial Ideas is for. It is to enable people to, even if they do have good arguments and good reasons and whatever, even if they're not the best, but if they're good, if, if they're worth taking into consideration, um, then they should be heard. And the way to respond to them, if, 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 if they are mistaken, is to explain carefully why they're mistaken and not just to denounce the source and say, you're a bad person. Right. So, Jeff, let's end on that note then. Uh, thank you so much again for the great conversation. Uh, just before we go, would you like to mention where people can find you and your work on the Internet? Well, I, I, I think if you just type in my name the, um, on Google, um, you can find my web page on the Faculty of Philosophy at the university. I used to have my own kind of web page, but it, it, that sort of disintegrated. And so I've, I've got most of my work is available on the Oxford Philosophy Faculty website. So I, though I have newer papers that I haven't put up there just because... I can no longer do it myself. The IT people have to do it, and I just tend not to trouble them <laughs> uh, to put links to my papers up there, my recent stuff. But, uh, okay. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm also leaving links to our first two conversations, which were also very interesting, mostly on the ethics of killing, but also other controversial topics like veganism, for example. So, Jeff, thank you again so much for taking the time to come on the show, and it's always a big pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I, I reciprocate those sentiments entirely. Um, again, uh, it, it seems to me you know more about academic uh, freedom and free speech than I do, just from the <laughs> way you, your questions are so insightful and, and well-formed. Um, I don't see how you do it. Um, it. It's an amazing series of interviews that you do. Um, well, so congratulations on a job very well done. Well, thank you so much for the kind words then.
Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Pereira Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henrik Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librant, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Panos Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilly Jr., Holt Erickburn, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.